Good morning, Mid Valley Bible Church. If you are able, would you please stand this morning with us as we begin singing?
seated. Well, good morning, and welcome to Mid-Valley Bible Church. So good to have you here this morning. If you are a guest this morning, we give you a special welcome. So glad to have you. We do have a special gift for you. We have some Mid-Valley mugs that are in the back with some candy in them and some other information. So grab one of these on your way out. So good to have you here today. We also do have that card in the bulletin. We would love to have you fill that out if you're comfortable. Give it to Pastor Doug or myself, or you can drop it in the box in the back. Or you can text MBC to the number screen, which is in your bulletin as well. But so good to have you here today. Amen. Yesterday, we had a great time at our trunk or treat. Appreciate all those who served by donating or by helping out yesterday. It was a great time. We did hand out many gospel tracts and many copies of the New Testament, the Gospel of John and Bibles. So the event is done, but the ministry isn't. So if you could be praying for, um, especially as we shared the gospel and handed out tracts yesterday, be praying that the Lord would be pleased to use that in people's lives. It was a great time. I do want to mention, on the Thursday evening men's Bible study, we have started a new book, A Survey of Bible Doctrine by Charles Ryrie, a very solid book. A very easy read, a book that's easy also to jump in any section. Any men interested in jumping in that, let me know. There's also the Tuesday morning men's study and the two ladies' Bible studies on Thursday as well. Pioneer Bible Camp is having a fundraising banquet here in a couple weeks. We are a great supporter of Pioneer Bible Camp for many, many, many years. But on Friday, November 10th, there is a banquet for them with some new staff members up in Ogden. And we have a couple tables as Mid-Valley Bible Church. If you are interested in being part of that, we have a sign-up sheet in the lobby and some cards out there. And I'll be at that table after service. We'd love to have you come up. Or if you have questions, you can talk to me. I'll be in the lobby after service. November 12th is going to be Tim Frost last Sunday as a music director here, and Doug will have some more things to say about that, but make sure you have that marked on your calendar. Appreciate Tim's faithfulness for so many years uh, here at Mid-Valley. Another thing, a lot of things going on. We have our adult Christmas dinner on Friday, December 8th, and there's also a sign-up sheet in the lobby for that. All right, last thing. Next week is daylight savings time. We fall back. Um, so make sure you change your clock for that. Or you could not change your clock, show up an hour early, and we'll have a really big Sunday school class. No, but uh, next week is that. Just take note of that. We would love to have you in Sunday school, though, as well. Let's pray, and we will continue. Father, I do thank you so much for your grace. Lord, you are the almighty God, the eternal God. The God that needs nothing. The God that sustains the universe by your own power. Lord, yet by your own choice you chose to create. And when we sinned and rebelled against you, you sent your Son to be the Savior. We do thank you for him. We do thank you that by his one death on the cross, he bore fully the penalty for our sins. We thank you that he lives again today at your right hand. We thank that anyone and everyone who simply comes to Him and trusts Him alone for salvation has their sins forgiven. Lord, as a church here, we gather those who have trusted Your Son. We gather as Your children, Your worshipers. We just ask for the service before us. As we continue to sing, as we fellowship, as we learn more about You, that our hearts and minds would be focused on You, Your greatness, Your grace. We would worship You in spirit and in truth. Do you pray this in your son's name? Amen. If you would, please stand again if you're able, and we'll continue with our worship service. <laughs> Father of mercy. 
Christ to be exalted. May Jesus' name be lifted high. For the sacrifice of love has won my pardon. And his resurrection power gives me life. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore, who reigns
They were no longer being taught. The truths that were written in the Bible, namely that a man is saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, had been abandoned. They'd been twisted and intermingled with false teaching. And that's our reason for doing this on this particular Sunday. And what I want to do is look at a man who really served as Luther's right-hand man. He was his sidekick. He was his tonto. He was his Robin from Batman. or You know, the person who worked right alongside him. And he was an important individual. And we owe a debt not only to Luther, but also to him. Because he was the one who brought the per church back to its original foundational teachings. He was a Protestant. He was a Protestant. And he was protesting against the organized church of his day. And one of the foundational passages is Romans 3, verses 19 through 30, where Paul makes abundantly clear I mean, just as clear as you could possibly make it, that a man and a woman is saved by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. And so towards that end, I want us to read from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 30. If you have a Bible, if you would follow along, I'll be reading from the New English Version. And if you are able, in honor of the reading of God's Word, would you please stand? All right, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no man, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And what becomes of our boasting? By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. For is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. This, beloved, is God's inspired, instructive word to us this morning. May our hearts be open to learn its lesson. You may be seated. Before I go to prayer, I just want to mention a couple of things. We do need to be praying for Charles Champlin. He remains in the hospital. He had a heart condition, and they're doing a number of tests and caring for him, and so we certainly need to be praying for him. We also want to be praying for Dave Bays. And let me mention, for those of you who might not be aware, on the piano this morning is Amy Bach. She's our guest musician this morning, and she is uh, following our morning prayer going to be favoring us with a selection on the panel. Let's now go to prayer. Our Father, we are ever so grateful for the blessing that we have in being able to take your word and to read from it and have it applied to our lives. And we are rejoicing, Father, this morning that the vast majority of people in our midst today have come to understand exactly what it was that Paul was talking about when he penned these verses in Romans chapter 3. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we learn about how these truths had such a profound impact on people's lives 500 years ago 
through the ministry and influence of a godly man named Philip Melanchthon. And I pray, Lord, that you would just cause our hearts to be open to what you desire to teach us. We thank you, Father, for the good trunk or treat yesterday. Thank you for the many children that were there. Thank you for those that received the tracts, and I pray that they would take them and that they would read them, that they would find that uh, there is here at Mid-Valley Bible Church a place where they can come and worship and be accepted and have your word honored. And Father, be a people who come under the sound preaching and teaching of God's word each and every Lord's Day. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Charles Champlin and ask that your grace and mercy, your hand of healing would be upon him, be with his wife in a very special way, encourage her as well as the entire family and the ministry team there in Brazil. We pray for our precious brother, Dave Bays, and ask that you would just sustain him. We are grateful, Father, for the progress that he's made. And Lord, I just would commit him now to your care and may your will be done in his life. And Father, we would be very remiss this morning if we did not also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We've been admonished to do that. And so I pray that you would be with the nation of Israel as they seek to uh, weed out wickedness and, and people who are seeking the destruction of them as a people and the destruction of them as a nation. I pray, Lord, that as they are the apple of your eye and they are God's people, that you would watch over them and that you would preserve them. And we look forward to that day when Jesus Christ as the Messiah will return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We pray for our president this day and ask that you would give him wisdom, give him discernment. We pray that he would seek you daily. We pray for our new Speaker of the House who is such an encouragement in that he is a very committed evangelical Christian. And I pray that as he will become, no doubt, the object of a great deal of ridicule and scorn because of his beliefs, because of his commitment to God's word, I pray that he would be able to withstand that pressure and that he would be willing to just stand up for the truth. And we pray that there would be people who are willing to rally around behind him and defend him. We just pray your continued blessing upon this church. Give wisdom to the elders and leaders as they make decision. We pray, Father, for continued unity within our body. And we commit the balance of our service now to you. For we've asked it together as God's people in Jesus' name. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen.
people said amen. <laughs> One more time, if you would, and you're able, would you please stand as we sing before the master. Ein Festenberg in Zunzer Gott. So begins the opening phrase in German of that nearly 500 year old hymn that we just sang. A mighty fortress is our God. It was written in 1529 by the Protestant reformer Martin Luther and served sort of the fight song for that movement. Luther, as I'm sure many of you are aware, was at the tip of the spear when it comes to the Protestant Reformation. 
He was a parish priest of the Augustinian order. And he had seen firsthand how corrupt the church had become. What's more, he had done something that few priests in his day had done. And that is he began an intense study of the scriptures. Wanting to answer the question that needs to be asked and answered by everyone. And that is namely, how is a man or woman made right before God? And by the grace of God, Luther came to the realization that a person is declared righteous before God, not on the basis of work, not on the basis of the sacraments, not on the basis of penance, but a man or woman is declared righteous before God by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And God used Luther to bring about a movement that continues to this day. But no one can do what they do or have the influence they have without the help of others. And at Luther's side for more than a quarter of a century was a man who was 14 years his junior, who in the providence of God came alongside him one year after he nailed his 95 theses to the church door at the parish of which he was the pastor. That man's name was Philip Melanchthon. Now, I realize that chances are good that all but a handful of you this morning know who he is and why it is we are indebted to him. And this morning, it's my intent to change that. And hopefully, at the end of this morning's message, you are going to understand why he was such a significant person in the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago. Because in a real sense, he was Luther's right-hand man. He was content to be in the shadows. He never wanted the limelight. That was what Luther wanted. But Melanchthon was willing to just be off to the side and to assist and to encourage and to help Martin in his quest for reform within the church. Now, Philip Melanchthon was born in 1497. He was the first of five children born to George and Barbara Schwarzer in Breton, Germany. Uh, Breton it was a significant city in that it was along a very important trade route, a very important highway in Germany that connected Germany with Italy, and it was through that route that merchandise would pass. At the time Philip was born, four years into their marriage, there were about 300 families living in that German city. Philip had four siblings, one brother, George, and three sisters. And all were born in his grandparents' house, which is where his parents, George and Barbara, were living. Melanchthon's father, George, was a master at forging lightweight, durable armor that the royalty as well as military personnel would wear. And he was exceptionally good at that. And because of his skills, he was very, very much in demand. His mother, Barbara, came from a wealthy merchant family. And so he was born into a family that we would call today upper middle class. But nonetheless, they were simple people in their manner and their lifestyle. They were a family who were upright. They were warmly and devotedly attached to the Church of Rome. As a couple, they had a good marriage and they loved each other deeply. George was particularly devout and the spiritual leader of the home. And he was a man who would spend hours each day in prayer, often after midnight when the family was sleeping. What's more, he was a man who did everything that the church asked of him. But tragically, 15 years into their marriage, when Philip was only 11 years old, in the year 1505, 1508, Philip's maternal grandfather died. And then 11 days later, on the 27th of October, his father died at the age of 49 after a relatively short illness. As I said, his dad was a very religious and pious man. And he did something that I think we as fathers need to emulate in dealing with our children. 
You see, three days before his death, knowing that he was about to die, he called all of his children to his bedside. And he did something that Philip would never forget. And that is he commended each of them to the protection of their heavenly father. And then he said the following. Did we get that? I don't know what the problem is with this, but it, here we go. He said the following, I have seen many and great changes in the world, but greater ones are yet to follow, in which may God lead and guide you. And then he said this, fear God and do right. After that blessing, three days later, his father died. And so Philip and the other children wouldn't be traumatized by seeing their own father die before their very eyes. His mother sent them to be with some relatives. But you know, Philip never forgot that seminal moment in his life. And the exhortation of his father to fear God and do what is right. And you know what? He did just that. Now, as you can imagine, the death of Melanchthon's father and grandfather in 1508, just 11 days apart, in a very real sense, ended the childhood of 11-year-old Philip. From that point onward, he was the man of the house. And he focused his attention on his education under the watchful eye of Johannes Reichland, who was a very famous human humanist and Hebrew scholar. Yeah, I'm not sure what the problem is with this. There we go. I think we might just have to, there it is. That's Johannes Reichland. He was, as I said, a famous humanist and Hebrew scholar. He happened, by the way, to be Philip's great uncle. And he took the responsibility for Philip's education. And when he met Philip, just as, as an 11-year-old boy, he knew immediately that he was dealing with someone who was not a normal 11-year-old. Philip was bright. He was gifted, he was eager to learn, and he realized that he possessed a great aptitude for the languages, especially Greek. And it was at that point that his great uncle, Johannes Reichland, gave him the Greek name Melanchthon. What happened is in March of 1509, Reichland exclaimed, see, I'm not sure, I'm just going to forget this, because it's just going to give me fits, and I'm not going to be able to focus. He said this. He said, your name is Schwarzer, which is German for black earth. He said, you are Greek. In other words, you're gifted in the Greek language, and so your new name shall be Greek. Thus, I will call you Melanchthon, which means black earth. You see, his uncle realized that he had someone special. And so what happened is, knowing his own limitations in that area, he brought in a man named John Unger to help him. And Unger was a very special individual. He had a private school, and both Philip and his brother George were part of that school, although Philip was clearly the more gifted of the two. And John Unger made a very, very profound impact on his life. In fact, years later, he would write of his love for this teacher and the impact he had and how he had shaped and developed him and molded him into being the man that he was. He writes this. I thought we'd try it. Let's go to the next one. You watch me. Oh, don't you love technology? By the way, at the grandparenting conference, big national conference being videotaped all over, they had so many problems, remember that? And I thought, you know, turnabout's fair play. But here's what Melanchthon wrote. He said, I had a teacher who was an excellent linguist. He died two years ago. He was an honest man. He taught the gospel and suffered much for the gospel's sake. He was pastor at Fort Sim. He drove me to the grammar and required me to construct sentences. He made me give the rules of construction by means of 20 or 30 verses from the Mantuan. He would not allow me to pass over anything. Whenever I would make a mistake, he plied the rod. In other words, 
He got spanked if he misbehaved, if he made a mistake. And yet with the moderation that was proper, thus he made me a linguist. He writes, he was a good man. He loved me as a son and I him as a father. In a short time we shall meet, I hope, in eternal life. I loved him notwithstanding that he used such severity, though it was not severity, but parental correction, which urged me to discipline. Can I just say parents and grandparents would be well to heed that last sentence? Sila. Well, Philip entered the University of Heidelberg with the intention of learning a, master, a, a Bachelor of Arts degree. And while he was there, he, he studied philosophy, rhetoric, astronomy, astrology, Latin, and Greek. Back then, 500 years ago, there were no fluff courses that you could sort of coast through as you went to college. There was no basket weaving, no history of rock and roll. If you went to college, if you went to the universities back then, you went there to get an education. Three years later, at the age of 15, he earned his Bachelor of Arts degree. I want you to think about that. This is a guy 15 years old, not even old enough to get a driver's license, and he's already graduated from college. He wanted to continue his education there and earn a Master of Arts degree, but his entrance into the program was barred by the faculty who claimed that he was too young to pursue the degree. But you know what the real problem was? They were fearful of his high intelligence. They were somewhat jealous of his ability at such a young age and they were intimidated by him. The fact of the matter is nobody wants a 15-year-old to be smarter than they are. And, and so what Philip did is he asked his great uncle what he should do. And Reichland's advice was that he move on to the University of Tübingen. And there he studied Greek, philosophy, classical law, literature, and mathematics. And again, people back then got an incredible education. And at the age of 19, he graduated with his Master of Arts degree. And upon his graduation, because he had learned so much about the Greek language, he published a Greek grammar that was widely used in the initial instruction of Greek for many years. Folks, this was a man who was no slouch. Now his fame began to spread. He was highly respected. He was in demand. And in 1519, he joined the faculty at the University of Wittenberg, where Luther was. He went there as a professor of Greek. And I love the letter that was sent asking him to come. In fact, the letter was actually sent to his great uncle, Johann Reichlin, and he in turn shared that letter of invitation and acceptance of asking him to come to the university there. And Reichlin said the following to Philip Melanchthon. He said, here you have the letter of the pious prince signed with his own hand in which he promises you his favor and protection. I will not address you in the language of poetry, but will quote the faithful promise of God to Abraham. And then I love this next line. He said, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. Isn't that great? The next time I want somebody to come, do something, I'm going to maybe quote that Bible verse. But then he went on and he talked about the position and he said he encouraged him to take it. And then he said the following, he said, such is my advice, be of a good courage, be not a woman, but a man. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, farewell. Well, Melanchthon went there, and he taught Greek, but he also wanted to teach theology there. 
His study had been in the philosophy, in philosophy and the classics, and of course Greek. And so by his training, he was not a theologian, but he loved theology. And so to work around the problem, he would teach his students Greek, not so much from the classics, but from the New Testament. He would have them study the Gospel of John in Greek. He had them study the book of Romans in Greek. And his classes were among the most popular at the university there at Wittenberg. When he would lecture, it was to standing room only crowds. In fact, there were sometimes as many as 400 people that would be in the room. He would later earn a master's degree from the University of Wittenberg in theology, and he would be uh, given the title of professor of Greek and theology. Interesting, the master's thesis that he wrote was taken from Romans chapter 4 on the doctrine of imputation, describing how Christ's righteousness is imparted to the believer. And again, after he did all of that, he was given the title of professor of Greek and theology. He studied with Luther. He was able to hold his own, and the two became close friends, professionally and personally. Now, what's interesting is at the beginning, when Philip got there to the university, that wasn't the case. Luther wasn't initially drawn to Philip as a friend, nor Philip to Luther. I mean, these two guys were absolutely polar opposites. Luther was loud, he was boisterous, he had a temper. He had a big frame, we might call him portly. He was prone to mood swings, he was unsophisticated, he said what he thought. He had no filter. Melanchthon, by contrast, was the exact opposite. He was very exact very measured, very refined in what he had said. And he was also sickly and weak. But there was something about him that really drew him to Luther. And the two became very good friends and partners who studied the Scriptures together from the original language. And when Philip came to Wittenberg, he came as a single man. And so Luther encouraged him to get married because he feared for his health and well-being. He thought that a wife would do him good. She would be someone who would be able to take care of him. Interesting that Luther wanted other people to marry, but he himself, as we talked about last year, when we talked about Luther and his wife Katharina, he, he stubbornly refused. Till in the year 1525, he married Katharina von Bora, who was a Roman Catholic nun who had escaped the convent, in part because of the writings of Luther. And Luther knew what a blessing a wife could be, and he wanted that for Philip and others, but he himself was reluctant to take a wife. And there was a good reason for that. And that was because Luther was a constant thorn in the side of both religious and civil leaders of his day. And there was literally a bounty on his head. And Luther was convinced that he would die a martyr's death. And he didn't want to leave a wife alone. But he felt that others should marry, especially Melanchthon. And so in 1521, two years after Philip got to the university there in Wittenberg, he married a woman named Katharina Krock, who was the daughter of the mayor at Wittenberg. Together they had four children, two boys and two girls. Unfortunately, one of the girls, who was the youngest, would marry one of his students and sadly end up, as often can happen, in a very abusive marriage to the point where the girl, his daughter, lost her life at the hands of her husband. Now, I share that story because Melanchthon did not live a charmed life. He knew heartache, disappointment, and trials. What else is interesting is that even though Philip and Martin got along beautifully and were good friends, their wives never did. 
these two Katarinas couldn't get along. In fact, it was reported by several of their Wittenberg colleagues that the two ladies would often refuse to be in the same room with one another. Well, Luther's influence on young Philip was great, and the reverse was true as well. Luther was impressed by Philip's knowledge of Greek, his diverse classical learning, as well as his insistence that if you were going to study something, you had to go to the original source. And so Luther greatly appreciated Philip's return to the Bible. He said when it comes to theology, when it comes to truth, we're not going to look at the church fathers or the popes or the cardinals or the councils. We're going to go to the source. We're going to go to the Bible. In fact, in 1519, Luther said the following when Melanchthon began his teaching at Wittenberg. He says, I have followed Philip Melanchthon as my teacher in Greek. He is young in respect to his body, but a hoary-headed old sage in regard to his intellectual powers. Now, friend, that's a fancy way of saying he had wisdom beyond his years. What's more, Luther was influenced, influenced Philip in the area of his theology especially in giving him a heart and a passion for getting out the gospel. And so these two men were early colleagues and reluctant friends. And together they would be an unstoppable force during the Reformation. Now, one of the keys to remember is something that happened in 1521, and we have a picture up there before you. If you see, in 1521, the same year that Melanchthon married his wife, Martin Luther was convicted of heresy and placed under a papal bull, an imperial ban, at the Diet of Worms. Now, Luther had been summoned by the Pope to appear, appear before a, a council of people made up of priests and cardinals and civil authorities. In fact, even Emperor Charles V was there. And he was called to the Diet at Worms to defend his teaching or to recant them. Luther at the time had gathered a very impressive following. People were no longer buying indulgences. They were no longer giving money to the church. Luther was hitting the Roman church where it hurt most, and that is their pocketbook. What's more, because of Luther, they were seen through the hypocrisy of the clergy and even the Pope. Religious back then, religion back then, just as it is today, was big business. What's more, people were part of the clergy for all the wrong reasons. And Luther spoke out against those issues. And so what happened is, is inroads begin to take place into the church. Luther was ordered to appear, and when he got there, all of his books, his pamphlets, his published sermons were set before him, and he was asked to renounce them. And instead, Luther asked for time to consider the issue, and the next day, he stood before the council, and he said, having been asked to recant, he said the following, if his imperial majesty desires a plain answer, I will give it to him. It is this. It is impossible for me to recant unless I am proved to be wrong by the testimony of Scripture or by evident reason. I cannot trust either the decisions of the councils or the Pope, for it is plain that not only have they erred, but contradicted each other. And then he said the following, My conscience is bound to the Word of God, and it is neither safe nor honest to act against one's conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God save me. Amen. In the end, after that diet at Worms, Luther was found guilty of heresy. He was declared to be an outlaw and an enemy of the state. And people were told that they could kill Luther upon sight or imprison him. And it was only because of the grace and quick thinking of his elector, Frederick the Wise, that Luther's bacon was saved. Because of that, Frederick uh, 
because of the guilty verdict, Frederick had whisked Luther off to the Wartburg Castle for safekeeping. And what happened is that Luther was literally on the run for several years, hiding from authorities that wanted to take his life. During that time, he was writing sermons, pamphlets, and commentaries. These were being made available to the people. But Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon, his good friend, was back at Wittenberg at the university, in a very real sense, holding down the fort. And what he was doing during that time is he was developing the first Lutheran system of theology. In other words, what Melanchthon was doing is writing a doctrinal statement for the Protestant movement that would later develop into what is called the Augsburg Confession. That confession, at the time it was completed, consisted of 21 articles that set forth what Luther and the movement that he was leading believed. And Melanchthon did this with the desire to have in writing a work that was intended to make all Christians thoroughly conversant with the Holy Scriptures alone. Now, I think the key to remember here is that everything he wrote came with the blessing of Luther. It was given his stamp of approval. In fact, Luther was so impressed with Melanchthon's writing that he said somewhat tongue-in-cheek that it should be added to the Christian canon. Luther was initially in hiding, and once it was safe for him to return to Wittenberg, he did. But this document that Melanchthon had been working on for years went through a total of three different editions or revisions. Until finally, in June 1530, it was presented at the Imperial Diet of Augsburg by none other than Philip Melanchthon, who had been its principal author. Both Luther and Melanchthon believed this to be a pivotal moment in the church. They said that his theology, his teaching, and his beliefs were, were important. They needed to, come, needed to come together. But they weren't so much, Melanchthon and Luther said, their beliefs as they were the beliefs that belonged to Christ. And by the way, there's a lot of debate among historians whether Luther was happy with Melanchthon's work. And the fact of the matter is he greatly was. In fact, Luther said, given his own personality, his disposition, his style of writing, that he never could have written that document because he would have written it in such a different manner altogether. Again, and this is key. These two men were polar opposites. And I was trying to think of what might be an analogy of two people who are supposed to be working together, who are absolutely polar opposites. And I came up with what I thought is an excellent illustration. Think of Martin Luther as Donald Trump, and Philip Melanchthon as Mike Pence, okay? They're working together, but boy, you talk about polar opposites. Now, how was it that this meeting at Augsburg came about? Well, what happened was simply this. The man in Germany that was in charge at the time was Emperor Charles V. And he called the Diet at Worms, uh, rather he had been at the Diet of Worms where Luther had been found guilty of heresy. And because the, 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 the community, Germany, was in such a schism, I mean there was such division among people, he saw his emperor, empire not only divided, but literally falling to pieces before his very eyes. Think, if you will, of our civil war back in the 19th century. Well, Charles V was facing the same problem. And it wasn't a conflict over slavery. It wasn't an economic war. It wasn't an issue of states' rights. It was a war over religion. It was a war over the church. It was a war over who was going to be in charge of the spiritual 
life of Germany. And so he saw the church fractured. He saw it divided. And he wanted to bring it together. He wanted these two warring factions, Protestants on one side, Catholics on the other, to come together. He felt that the conflict and this religious upheaval had run its course and it was time to act. Again, on the one side, you had the Protestants who were followers of Luther, and on the other side, you had the Catholics who were the followers of the Pope. And he wanted them to come together. He wanted them to compromise. And because there was a bounty on the head of Luther, and he was considered a heretic and an outlaw, and Luther probably wouldn't have come even if they had asked him because he didn't trust the Pope, Melanchthon went in his place. And he became Luther's chief representative. And even though he wasn't as bombastic with an overwhelming personality as was the case with Luther, Melanchthon represented the Protestant cause with excellence. And he never gave an inch, not one inch, on the fundamentals. This gathering of religious and civil leaders wasn't a calm, peaceful, kumbaya moment. These two warring factions weren't there to smoke a peace pipe. They went there with the intent of slugging it out and may the best man win. And there was a lot of tension, a lot of tension in the room at the Diet of Worms. In fact, one of Melanchthon's students who was there said that one of the Roman Catholic cardinals who was from Italy, Cardinal Campeggio, bared the claws of Satan, he wrote, himself with his intimidating snarl. And then he wrote, St. Philip stood as if in the midst of lions, wolves, and bears, which could tear him into little bits and pieces. But he displayed a superabundance of splendid courage in his slight frame, and he answered boldly, We commit ourselves and our cause to God our Lord. And when the confessional was presented, signed by Melanchthon and others who were present representing the Protestant church, the men who signed it knew that in a very real sense they were signing their death warrants. Friend, it was kind of like the framers of the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. When they signed that document, they knew that in a very real sense they they were signing their lives away. In fact, one historian said Christian heroes they were who were not afraid to place their names under the confession, although they knew it might cost them goods and blood, life and limb. One of the men who signed it was asked by Melanchthon if he really understood the consequences of what he was doing. And he said that he did. And he said that he would confess his Lord, whose cross he prized higher than all the powers of the world. Well, Melanchthon returned to Wittenberg. And most see that moment, that diet at Augsburg. And by the way, the word diet simply means council, a gathering together of religious and civil authorities. This diet at Augsburg as the beginning of the Protestant church, the Lutheran church in particular. Now, for the sake of complete disclosure, not everything that Melanchthon wrote we in the Bible church would agree with. But you know what? On the fundamentals of the faith, he was spot on. What's more, he was incredibly courageous. He was defending the five key points of the Reformation, the five solas. And we've talked about what those were. First of all, there's sola scriptura, which is simply scripture alone that the Bible and the Bible only is our highest and ultimate authority. Scripture alone reveals the way of salvation and sanctification. The second sola is sola fidea, that we're saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, and that no amount of human goodness can merit eternal life. Thirdly, there's sola gratia, grace alone. We're saved by grace The grace of God alone. Salvation is not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. And it's given to us without cost to those who cannot earn God's favor. 
Fourth, there's solus Christus, Christ alone. And that simply says that Christ alone, was a, salvation alone was accomplished exclusively by Jesus Christ through his substitutionary death on the cross to save sinners. And finally, there's sola deo gloria. And that is that your life and mine are to be lived for the glory of God alone. Now, friend, those five truths are the bedrock. They're the foundation of a true church. And friend, any church that deviates from those five essential truths is a church in error. And that's why we look to these men. We appreciate them. We revere them. We want to know their story. We want to know what they were declaring, what they were defending, what they were proclaiming. And I suspect, given the fact that over the past 10 years that I've been here, we've observed Reformation Sunday, some of you might think, well, they, we should be worshiping them. And friend, that's not what I'm suggesting this morning. But you know what we need to do? We need to appreciate them. We need to know that our roots, in a very real sense, go back to these men. Now just to wrap this up and put a bow on it, when the battles of the Reformation took their toll on Luther and he died on February 18, 1546, at the age of 62, do you know the man who was chosen to speak at Luther's funeral? Right, Philip Melanchthon. And to show you just how much he loved Luther, in the last letter that he wrote to Luther, just days before he died, Philip Melanchthon began the letter to Luther with these words. He said, to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther, distinguished for his learning, virtue, and wisdom, doctor of theology, restorer of the pure, pure doctrine of the gospel, my most dear friend. And then he went into the body of the letter. You know, I have never gotten a letter like that. I would love to get one someday. If you want to shoot me an email, you can say all these wonderful things. And what's interesting is that Luther was equally profuse in his praise of Melanchthon. He called him a most worthy brother in Christ, a faithful servant of God. But you know, the greatest praise came when Melanchthon wrote a letter acknowledging Luther's death. He wrote the following, This morning we received your very sad letter, one of the illustrious prince elector and the other to the reverend pastor of our church, in which with great sorrow you write of the death of the reverend Dr. Martin Luther, our most dear father and preceptor. And then he writes this. He said, He was the chariot and the charioteur of Israel. Now, they thought the church was Israel, so they were a little messed up on their eschatology, but they got their soteriology right. We're not going to be too hard on them for that. But he said that Luther was the chariot and the charioteer of Israel, raised up by God to restore and purify the ministry of the gospel. For we must confess that by him doctrine was revealed, which is beyond the range of the human mind. Then he writes, bereft of such a teacher and leader, we are deeply pained, not only on account of the university, but also on account of the church throughout the world, which he directed by his counsel, teaching, authority, and by the aid of the Holy Spirit. Fourteen years after the death of his mentor and Fred Melanchthon died, at the time of his death, he was trying to bring unity to the church. There were people that were fighting. Amazing how people fight over the silliest of things. And these people, part of the Reformation, they were fighting. They were quibbling. They were arguing over secondary issues. The church was fractured. And Melanchthon was trying to bring peace to it. And as he was doing that, he got sick. He had a fever. And a few days before the end came, he wrote on the left side and the right side of a piece of paper, the reasons why he shouldn't fear death. He said, I don't fear death because thou shalt depart from sin. Thou shalt be set free from vexation and from the rage of theologians. Thou shalt come into the light. Thou shalt see God. Thou shalt behold the Son of God. 
as his weakness increased and the end drew near, the attending pastor asked him if he wished anything else, and he said, nothing else but heaven. Do not ask me anymore. He's saying, stop bugging me. Just let me die in peace. The pastor then prayed. Everyone present fell to their knees. That evening, the pastor pronounced a blessing on him. And one of the professors at Wittenberg who was there with him, one of his colleagues, quoted from the psalm that says, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, thou faithful and true God. Reports are that as Melanchthon was hearing that prayer, his own lips were moving. And at a quarter before 7 o'clock in the evening, on April 19, 1516, Philip Melanchthon was ushered into the presence of Jesus at the age of 63 years. His earthly tabernacle dissolved, in the pre- dissolved and he was in the presence of God. And he was a man that we can say who fought the good fight. He finished the course, he kept the faith. And because of that, there was laid up for him a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to all those who love his appearing. Understandably, he was buried in the same cemetery in Wittenberg as his mentor, Martin Luther. Friend, he's somebody that we should know and at least be familiar enough to say, you know what? He did some great, great things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this somewhat unique Sunday where we talk about some of the heroes of the faith. And we rejoice that you used Martin Luther and Zwingli and Savonarola and Melanchthon and Huss and Calvin and others 500 years ago to bring about a movement where the church, the organized church that had become so corrupt was was brought back to its senses. and, And they weren't able to reform it. They had to break away. They had to protest against the church. They had to start their own movement, and we're grateful for the courage that it took for them to do that. Thank you, Father, that by your Holy Spirit you revealed to them the truth, that a man is made right before God by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone through grace alone, and that the authority for that is found in the Scriptures alone, and we are to live our lives then to the glory of God And so I pray that we would learn to do just that. And we pray as God's people for that end. In Jesus' name, everybody agreed and said, Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing together. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tongue. salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves, is our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let me just mention, before I pronounce the benediction, this was a different kind of service, different kind of sermon. Don't normally do this. I do this one Sunday out of the 52 each year. We do it on Reformation Sunday. But in case you perhaps missed what I was trying to communicate, it was simply the fact that Luther and Melanchthon and so many of the reformers 500 years ago realized that the way that a man or woman is made right before God is not on the basis of the church. It's not on the basis of the sacraments. It's not on the basis of penance or any of those things, giving money, whatever. 
It's on the basis of grace through faith alone in Christ alone. And if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, we'd invite you to do so. We have a little book at the back of the church called How to Begin the Christian Life. It's our gift to you. We'd love you to take it home with you. Read it over. My contact information's there. And if you're here this morning you don't know for certain that if you died tonight that you'd be on your way to heaven, that you'd immediately be in the presence of God. Not one millisecond would pass from the moment of your last breath that you would be breathing the air of heaven. You can have that assurance. And we're here to help you towards that end. So please, contact me, contact Pastor Duane, contact Jagger. Any of those men will be more than happy to help you. That's why we're here. We're here to give you the good news that Jesus Christ saves. And we're going to shout that until he comes back again. Father, thank you again for our time together this morning. Thank you for these precious people who've listened so attentively. And I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to have a profound appreciation for these men who courageously stood for the truth 500 years ago against overwhelming odds, literally putting their lives on the line for the truth. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to go out and boldly proclaim that message that Jesus saves. We ask now that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship and communion of God's Spirit would be with us as we now go out into the world. And we pray as God's people towards that end, in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed and said, Amen. Let's sing. Shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This is Bless you, and you are dismissed.